What up, ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Warden here. Today we're gonna to talk about offloading of state to AWS for easy testing in general. What we're gonna cover is the what, why, and how of why you would wanna offload state to Amazon Web Services or AWS owned by Amazon. Why would you wanna do that? They're one of the many cloud providers. Uh, why wouldn't you wanna host your own, use Heroku, things like that. And what does state mean from a code and infrastructure perspective and how you go about testing these stateless architectures? Uh, a couple ways we can do that. My main goal is really to inspire you to write stateless code on top of stateless infrastructure. I have no agenda other than I find it fun. It's really neat to create code that's a little more predictable, figure out the ways in which I can release it and feel confident around this test that handle it. And then once it's up there, I don't have to worry about it. That makes me feel really good and I'm trying to get better at that. So I wanted to share with y'all today some of the things that I've learned. So the first hypothesis is that if your code is stateless, then it's easier to test. And let me give you an example. Stateful testing is where you have a class or your function does some kind of side effect. And so you have to set up some kind of mock to pretend to be the outside world, either the one that's affecting it or what it's gonna affect after it runs. And so you do a mock. Quick caveat, we're gonna use Python a lot in here. Python is not my favorite language. It's one of the easiest to use, one of the hardest to actually get run on your machine and your coworkers machines. But from a language learning perspective, it's it's what I've been using a lot at work and, it's, and the asynchronous concurrency stuff is a lot easier to do in Python than it is in JavaScript. So when we talk about mock setup, what we mean is a you have a, a set of code that's gonna pretend to be S3. S3, if you're not aware, is Amazon's, one of their first services is to have a hard drive in the cloud. So you upload files and people download it. When you go to Facebook or any other social media website and you see images, that's probably where they're coming from. So it's a quick way to store a lot of files, serve those files, and they're just static, like HTML, things like that. They don't change, they don't run code, they don't do anything magic. But we're gonna mock that. We're gonna mock that service. We're gonna pretend to be S3 and how it works in code. The object under test that we're testing, in this case, is the user's parser. And we'll pass in the real bucket and the real key, the real key or file name. But when we call parse, we have to look internally either through some public access or some way to verify that it worked. And so that mock is either A, set up to do that and we look internally on the data, or B, we actually make assertions on the mock, very similar to spies or things like that in other languages. So that's what we mean by stateful testing. You're testing the thing under test, but you have to mess with all the stuff around it to tweak it to make it work, whether internally or externally. When we talk about stateless testing, what we mean is there's no state. <laughs> so you, you have a function, it takes inputs, returns an output, and you assert on that output. And there shouldn't be any side effects. And what we mean by that is your code or unit test should be able to have your wireless off, you should have no access to a hard drive, and it should just work. And that's what we mean by stateless. There's no state. So we use a function to give you an example of that. The object on their test is the function, and the assertion is on what that function returns. So state is hard. State is really hard. Programming is hard, and state is one of the hardest things about it. Uh, the goal is if you pay AWS to do that well, then a lot of your problems kind of go away, or at least makes it easier to deal with state. An example of infrastructure state would be who's at fault. So lots to blame would be like, when you have AMIs, AMIs is the operating system that you're using. Are you using Red Hat? Are you using Ubuntu? What, what are you using? Windows. You have to rehydrate those a lot. Sometimes the, the more regulated your industry, the more you're forced by federal law in my country to update those things. So you can't have servers that have OSs that are really old and open to attack from hackers. You have to update that stuff constantly. In EC2, which is this uh, Amazon server, that could go down. A Docker container for updated by Qualysys. Qualysys is one of the security companies that can find vulnerabilities in your Docker container, for example, and then you have to update that. So you, okay, I updated to some library, but does my code still work? Mm, does it still work on the EC2? Mm. For Node, the, the pro of Node is that it updates very often. The bad news is if you're using it in Docker, you can update your Docker continuously to a new LTS version for global exceptions. A lot of times that your code will have some kind of global exception maintainer look at an error and then crash itself because it's on Kubernetes or ECS or EKS or something like that. The opposite, you don't have global exception and it crashes, puts it in a weird state and you're not sure what's up with that container. And a few of those containers are doing it. Next thing you know, you have a swarm that's kind of in a weird state. You're not sure what's going on with your code. The best thing to do is flush it and just restart. ECS, it can have one bad EC2. I've seen ECS on Amazon where the Elastic Container Service will constantly attempt to use the one bad EC2. The other EC2s are fine. There's six of them. God forbid it use the other five that already have like three containers each running perfectly good. AWS's fault though would be S3. 
like that's not you if S3 goes down. They maintain the hard drive in the cloud. You're just uploading files. You can't really break S3 uh, intentionally, excluding changing the bucket policy or your IAM role access rights to it. Like it doesn't go down. If S3 goes down, a, a large portion of the internet, both public and private, goes down. It's not your fault. You can thank Bezos for that and Obama. This is why in 2020, we still have the concept of turning things on and off again because state is so hard. State can get, go bad. There's no way to fix it or unknown how it got there in the first place. And it's just to refresh, right? It's, that's why front end development's a lot easier than back end. You just refresh the browser, folks. So not about placing blame though. It's what, what we're talking about is it's architecting for what we're good at. And that is testing and writing code. If you are from an ops perspective, you might completely disagree with that statement because you love ops. You, you deal with Helm and Kubernetes and all the other you know, Unix things around that, the shell scripts, the Jenkins, the deployment, dealing with your Ansible, and that's fine. If that's what your shtick is, cool. From a software development perspective, I don't want to deal with any of that. I want to take my code, put it online from an API and front end perspective, have it work and feel confident that it works both locally and when it's up there, it's not going to like get in a bad state. So that's, that's where I'm coming from, from a testing and writing code perspective. Hypothesis number two is that if you put state in AWS from a code and infrastructure perspective, the code itself becomes easier to test because there's less for it to worry about because AWS is managing that. So those two things are really compelling like feelings and arguments around making your life easier through infrastructure, which usually is the opposite in my experience. Infrastructure complicates everything. Code works locally, but then as soon as you give it to somebody, uh, somebody else's machine, you put it in a server, it breaks, right? So what if you could let somebody else deal with those problems? That's, that's compelling. I love simplifying you know, my life and coders lives. So when we talk about state from a code perspective though, what, well, let's dive into what that means. Specifically, it means anything from variables. When you're doing a for loop and you have an I, right? Or an incrementer, that, that variable in there. Class instances, when you instantiate a class or a singleton, right? They have state internally. File and DB handles, they have state of, have you read it? Are you in append mode? Are you in actively reading? Are you in the middle of an ACID compliant you know, put? Those kind of things. And environment variables, those may or may not be there, right? From a testing perspective, we're really talking about setting up and tearing down. So you set up stuff, your mocks, your world, run your test, then you tear it down. Or you instantiate the class with a bunch of complicated things that require to make it built, then you assert that object under test, that kind of stuff. You might ha even have to spin up temporary infrastructure if you're doing integration tests on a uh, secluded environment. And this could be important, especially if you're using like, let's say AWS SAM, serverless application model, or you're the serverless framework. You wanna build your own stack and test it. So that's setup, right? And then mount a bank. Mount a bank would be doing mock APIs. If you want to test a, uh, uh, an API call with like stateful calls in your code, maybe even front end, but you don't want to create a back end. You just want to fake it. You want to have a consistent stubs coming back every time, but you still want to see that latency, that interaction, mount the bank scrape. It's a, a step beyond contract test because you can play and feel with it and see how it works. So that's what we mean by that. What is not state? So if we know what state is, what is not state? Well, not state would be function return values. When you do function return values, whatever that expression returns, that's not state, it's a value. Things like constants, they don't change. I don't mean array in JavaScript where you can make a constant push. What I mean is things like 42. You're not gonna change what 42 means you're not gonna, unless you're gonna go in RAM and tweak the bits, right? So 42 is constant, it never changes, it's not stateful. It always and always will be 42. So when we say what is state then, from a, an infrastructure perspective, we mean things that like, is your server up? <laughs> Is your Docker container up? Is your cluster healthy? Are you monitoring it? Is Datadog looking at it and telling you things are good? Right? That's what we mean by infrastructure is up. So for example, uh, EC2, ECS, or EKS, that they have a lot of state. They manage EC2s, Docker containers on them, and the health of those systems, and then they try to self-heal if Docker containers crash, if ETCs crash, they kind of bring it up, right? From a Docker perspective, same thing. Your Docker container could be good, but the code is in a bad state or the ECS agent on it is not able to talk to Datadog and the ECS and things outside of it. The FluentD driver isn't able to talk to your log stream system for some whatever reason. So although it was there and you didn't touch it, it just stopped working. That's what we mean by state. Long running code is a really big one. When you run large batch processes that take time, they're going into different state machines and different states. What point is it good or bad? Do you know? And that's what we mean by long running code. It's very difficult to load all that into your head. Examples of making it worse is distributed architectures, such as GoRoutines using Erlang or Elixir, or even Akka actors, for example, with Scala and Java, or just simple Java threads. 
you have a bunch of things going on at the same time, which may or may not happen at the same time because downstream systems, that's a really, really complicated set of state. And do you know if that's okay? Is it self-healing? Really, really hard. And then I, I misspell Jenkins on purpose because it's janky. You could have a bill deploying a microservice that could sabotage your existing repo. And everything else was fine until that one thing came in and started sending bad messages that they didn't conform to the contract. So we talk about Jenkins build. Nginx or behind a, a firewall, it could have a web cache problem. And suddenly your Nginx server is supposed to be stateless, request in, request out. But because it's sending the wrong HTTP code, for example, for responses, it's poisoning the cache. Uh, files in an S3 bucket. The bucket's stateless, kind of, but like the files up there, are they there or not? If you go to read it and it's not there, what happens? So that's what we mean by state in infrastructure. So what is stateless infrastructure? Is there even such a thing? Well, kind of. There is no server to be up. So when we talk about serverless, that's what we mean by stateless, as in there's no server to worry about. There's no Docker container, no server. There's still state out over time. We, we still are struggling to get around time. I, ha I have some ideas, people have ideas how to fix that. But for now, time is a fact. We live in the fourth dimension. And so that's, that's one thing that serverless doesn't really solve. So, uh, but let me give an example of some of the parts. So for example, Lambda, a Lambda function, an input output, we talked about function return values. That's a perfect example, step functions. They have very defined states and you cannot crash them. That's why they force you to use JSON instead of writing code. And you're orchestrating all these downstream systems. So although the downstream systems might be idempotent and have side effects and do all kinds of crazy stuff, crash, maybe not crash, the step function won't. The step function will always work and have very predictable deterministic ways of working. And so that's, when we talk about state from that perspective, we always know what state it's in. It's very deterministic. Event bridge, another one, you fire and forget. So if you're used to CloudWatch, for example, a lot of the, the or stuff around CloudWatch events is moving to EventBridge at the time of this video. So EventBridge is your way of doing event buses. So you can either the schedule cron jobs or you can send an event. If you're from an SNS background, the simple um, networking or messaging service, I forget what it's called. But yeah, SNS, you send a message, to fire and forget. And it scales to you know hundreds of thousands of concurrent requests. And so the whole point of SNS is that you fire a message, you don't know if it worked or not, but you feel confident that you you sent it. You don't really care if like the person down the team received it, right? It's very similar to Twitter. Like when you post a tweet and Twitter's like, you got it. You don't know if anybody read it unless you get like trolls. You're not really sure, right? So that's what we mean by stateless infrastructure. Hybrids would be like AWS batch. You want the ability to bring up a ECS cluster, run a bunch of really strong code with really powerful EC2s and then shut down. So you don't want to manage keeping ECS up all the time. You just need it for a, you know, a couple minutes, a couple hours. Uh, maybe you need it all day. That, that's what we mean by batch. So it's, it's stateless in that they deal with bringing up the ECS and bringing it down. You don't. S3 is another example. Although it's stateless in terms of a hard drive and it's always on, like 99%, 99.9 uptime, the files on there can affect that state. So there, there's a different S3 depending upon what files you upload, what state they're at, the types of files, things like that. Dynamo, it's a serverless database in that you don't have to manage if it's there, connections, partitions, even if you're doing global regions, you don't have to manage any of that. But the data in it, the types of permissions, the types of queries, where they're at, the time to live, there's still some state in there that makes it a little difficult to be completely deterministic. And then SQS, very similar to SNS, but it has those messages that exist in time. And even if you're dealing with a FIFO queue, first in, first out, and it's ordered, you still may or may not have that message that you could view because somebody else is doing it in a distributed architecture. So SQS is stateless in that you can fire to it and it feels dependable from an infrastructure perspective, but the messages on it are not. And then Kinesis, like Kafka, like Slack, like chat and Fortnite, it's, you know, it's nuts. There's state all over the place. There's different shards. So that's what we mean by hybrid stateless. They manage most of the hard uptime of the hardware and the software updates and things like that, but there's still a little onus on you to know where you're at from a state perspective. So how do you take the state out of the code? Let's do this first so you can see how you do it in code, and then we'll show you the infrastructure and where hopefully someday it'll get to. So from a high-level coding perspective, as long as you favor pure functions over classes, you use function composition, where you take a bunch of functions that are stateless and you put them together in chains of functions, and you have higher level functions. So very similar to have a class that has private functions and you expose a public method to give it an, an API and you test the public method and it tests all the internals, these little abstracted black boxes that you build all these boxes and connect them together. 
Function composition is the same thing. You just have a bunch of pure functions, link them together, and then you have this like one public function exposed to a module, and you do it the same way. The difference is, is that you defer state until the very end. That's the goal. And that's what we mean by number three is push it to the edges. Make state somebody else's problem or future use problems. It usually what happens, but that's fine. And then number four is dependency injection or the effect pattern. I always do DI first because it's the easiest. It's the easiest to use in all languages. A lot of the object-oriented programming areas that exist, it's very easy to use that language and they know what you're talking about. So when you say dependency injection, you're like, oh yes, dependent. we're from a OOP background, we know what that is. Whereas you say the effect pattern, they're like, effects? I don't know, what are you saying, is that the A word, effects? Or I don't know what you mean. So DI is a little more portable, but the effect is actually the more powerful one. So we talk about favor functions over classes. What we mean is, is that instead of having your wrapping like a Dynamo table, for example, using the Boto3 API in Python, to access DynamoDB, what we mean is just use a function. And if you look, there's a lot of state in that class. You have to instantiate it, and now it has state in it, and then you call a method on it, and that internal state may or may not have changed. So you have to know if you connect it successfully before you're allowed to call that. Where a function, all that goes away. It either works or it didn't work. There's no state, and if it is, it's during the execution, maybe. It depends on how you actually execute that function. So let me give you a breakdown uh, how you would kind of move away from that. So when we talk about favorite functions over classes, we mean the first one's okay, but it still has got some state in it. That Boto3 is a concrete implementation that has connections, that has retry, that has IAM roles, has permissions, has do you have wireless? Are you logged in with ABIS tokens? Can you even talk? There's a lot of things going on in that little Boto3 keyword that, you know, or state that may or may not work. So when we talk about it's not quite better yet, it's because it's all you're doing is shrinking how much code you have to write. We still have the same problem. If you do option one of dependency injection, you take that dependency that talks to Dynamo and you inject it. And it has some downstream effects from both from a unit testing perspective, but also from further upstream where they give you those dependencies and verify that they're legit before it even arrives, for example. So it's more from dependency injection is more from a testing perspective that where you really see the benefits, but there are some niceties from a pure perspective where you can test it because you know that the dependencies have been vetted before they arrive at your function. And then the, the real powerful one is the effect. So this is kind of pseudocode from Python, but I'm utilizing the async await syntax in Python because it's a lot different compared to the async await syntax in JavaScript, which is where a lot of people I think have their first experience, at least where mine was, from a effect perspective when you're coding with effects. The promises in JavaScript are eager. As soon as you instantiate something like that or call it, it immediately runs. That's not how it works in Python. They give you a function called a coroutine. It's your responsibility to execute it. So if you ever use like, let's say Folktail, for example, version two in JavaScript, you call their asynchronous task, but then you have to call a run method. So although you get it, you then have to call it again to run it. And it seems a very strange thing to call a function and then call whatever it returns again. Like that's, that's weird. But if you think about your deferring actually running the effects and suddenly all your functions guaranteed to work. Now your initial reaction is like, well, that, if you've never seen this before, that's silly. It's not actually doing anything, but that's not true. It's taking your inputs. It's doing a lot of things with it. If you're using things like MyPy and others, it could be validating types. There's a lot of things that go on when you start merging these things together. So just because you call a function, it doesn't actually run the side effects. There's still some really cool things happening in the background of work. So again, we're running your code. We're not actually gonna run the effect, we're deferring that. You now arrive at, all right, Jesse, you have to have side effects to do anything interesting in software. So making your code stateless seems really stupid because you're just kind of procrastinating. But what if there was a way where you could take all side effects, all state out of the language itself? And suddenly you're writing code that doesn't do anything interesting. You're just writing functions. How is that even possible? Can you actually produce anything of value? If you take the state out of the language and you're coding stateless things all the time, who actually manages it? Well, the runtime, the language, they manage all the side effects. You just write the code. You just write stateless code that's a lot easier to test. A lot of those problems go away and your life is improved as a coder. And they focus on the hard problems of running that stuff. And if they test it enough, then suddenly your code has a lot more likelihood chance of working when you run it and compile it and somebody else manages the hard part of side effects so it means you deploy code, it works. If it doesn't work, it's not your fault. That sounds amazing, right? It sounds impossible. Well, Elm does it. Elm has no side effects. It's one of the programming languages for building 
browser-based applications that has no side effects. You write pure functions all over the place with deferred effects and they manage the effects. So it's not even deferred effects, it's more so like just objects, JavaScript objects really under the hood and they manage all the side effects. And that is very, very compelling. So let me show you an example of Python compared to Elm. If Python, when you use the request module, it's very similar to the request module or node fetch or Axios in JavaScript, for example, or even just simple XHR calls or fetch in the browser, you're gonna make an HTTP call to get. So when you call get users in Python, it's going to make an HTTP call and it may or may not work. Your wireless has to be on, the website has to be up, you have to have permission, the servers, cores has to be enabled, blah, 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 blah. All that stuff has to work. That is initiated when you call that function. When you do the same thing in Elm and you say, I'm gonna make an HTTP get call and you call this function get users, it doesn't actually make a call. It just gives you an object back and that's it. <laughs> so like, there's no secret, just, that's just what it does. Now you're like, okay, well, when does it actually do the call? And that's based on the Elm architecture where these objects are actions or commands and it deals with the details of the side effects. So if it works, it's gonna call a function. That function is gonna take the input of if it worked or not. So the side effect of actually making the call and going through still could result in it worked or it didn't work, but your code doesn't care. Your code is an input and an output. You test that input and output, make sure everything looks good, you're good. Then you have types on top of that to make your job even easier. In the Python case, that would be like uh, MyPy. So you can see where this is going, where having no state in your code makes things a lot easier, especially if it's stateless. So the closer you can get to that, the better your life's gonna be as a developer, front end and back. And so from a testing perspective, let's, let's elaborate on that. So even if you do the really simplest mock, where you mock a request from the outset, the object under test, you make the call and then you just assert that test. This will work whether your wireless is off or not. This is a good unit test from a Python perspective. But in Elm, there is no state, so you don't have any mocks. You don't even need any stubs. You can just assert that it got an object back. You can call it without concretes. You don't even need dependency injection because it's not actually doing any side effects. So suddenly doing dependency injection goes away. You don't have to create stubs. You don't have to do dependency injection frameworks. You just call your function the same as you would in regular code. So suddenly your unit tests look very similar to your code. So there's no drift between mocks and stubs making it behave slightly different. The way you write unit tests may be a little bit more lax than you would write in regular code. Like suddenly those things go away too. So it's a very compelling thing to not have state in your code and very helpful. Imagine these kind of things. Hopefully you're thinking about how these could positively affect you from an infrastructure perspective. So if you're learning, wondering like, how do I get from a code perspective? I've never seen you know, stateless architectures from a code perspective. Be aware, it's very hard. It is not the norm. There's a lot of horrible functional programming teachers. I myself am trying not to be one of them, I'm trying to get better. But this is, I think, a good path for you to follow if you've never done this before, is you need to learn pure functions. Eric Elliott, a lot of other people have posted really long in-depth articles all over Medium, all over blogs. So you learn about these three rules, which sounds, trite but i'm telling you man they they really can change your life so if you learn number one you are well on your way once you get past one it's all kind of downhill <laughs> sort of it's until you get to category three then it's over uh, but lenses you don't have to learn all lenses like prism and some iphone just focus on getter and setters how do i get data if i don't have types or it's deeply nested or i don't know where it came from like it's json from some third-party xml soap service using pure functions. How does that work? So lenses are very, very compelling. The simple would be Git and Lodash. Um, and list comprehensions, map, filter, reduce, they're all over in every language, but they're also optional. You don't have to use map and filter and reduce in JavaScript. They're built in the array, but how many for loops have you seen in JavaScript code bases? They're all over the place, right? Uh, same with Ruby. Like Ruby, Python, they all have you know a little bit of both, and that's fine. But understand why you would use recursion over iteration, right, and stateful loops makes you think. And then it's, it's called a bunch of different things, but railway programming, pipeline and chaining functions, monadic burritos, all that stuff where you're linking these functions together. So in class-based architectures like object-oriented programming, you create classes and abstract them, you expose public APIs, and you either abstract that or use some amalgamation of those plus modules, right? Functional programming is very similar where you take those functions and you link them together and expose kind of public APIs or public chains to do those data manipulations. So we talk about railway programming where it's like it could go on a good path or a bad path. That's, that's kind of what we mean. And then lastly, programming with effects or dealing with IO and, and pushing that to the side and the variety of different 
styles that different programming languages take, pragmatic versus really strict, that kind of stuff. This is kind of your, your high level learning path for that. So now that you know how to do it with code and there's languages that help do it for you, how do you do that with infrastructure? And it's using stateless infrastructure. <laughs> So Lambda is step functions, SNS, and all the hybrids. But then you take stateless code and put it on the stateless infrastructure. So you can still put stateful code on like a Lambda, right? That it remembers things, it exposes a port to listen for web requests, and then after the 15 minute timer, Lambda shuts down, right? You could do that. But the, the, the mindset is stateless code, stateless infrastructure, and you get you know, a lot compounding dividends, good stuff, right? So let me give an example of a Python Lambda. I get this question all the time. How do you test Lambdas locally? And I, I don't think they're talking about unit tests. People are saying, how do I run the thing? Because they're used to like, I load code, I throw it on a server and call an API endpoint. That's not really how it works. When we say like Lambdas are, are functions, that's what we mean. Now I know they take more than, you know, more than t one input, right? Lambda functions are t typically monadic in that they have one input, one output. They're um, you know, using Lambda Calculus, which is all about one, that's where Curring came from, for example, from Haskell Curry. But what we mean is, is that you have a function that takes an event, and that event could be anything you want. It could be a, a dictionary, it could be a JSON object that's converted to dictionary, it could be a string, it doesn't matter. The point is that you have a function that takes an input and returns something. It doesn't have to return something, and that's kind of the, the joy of, if you haven't been in this background, you can you know, go up the learning curve. But if you, want to see how it works, that Lambda handler, you literally go Python index py, this file, and it runs. And it's, it's, if you see that if name equals main, it's very similar in JavaScript, where if you are called through node app.js, in this case, Python index py, or if you require the file, that code on the bottom isn't going to run. So this allows you to test locally, deploy it in AWS, and it doesn't actually run this code on the bottom. So you notice we're giving it an empty dictionary, and it just makes a web request, because it doesn't do anything with event or context. That's literally it. You just go Python index, you run your Lambda and it runs locally and it even has side effects and it makes a web request. So, it, but the, the important thing is that it's going to run about the same locally as it is remotely because you're not using weird C libraries, you're not doing anything else. The only difference is like, do you have access to the public internet in your Lambda if you're using a VPC or security groups? Like that's it. So that should make you feel really good. It's suddenly all those problems, those stateful problems go away. And that's with stateful code, right? So imagine if you start doing stateless code, you have tests around, you feel a lot more confident and you build those series of different types of tests. It really makes you feel good to know that you have more confidence in what you release. A quick way to make this testable is to use dependency injection using default parameters. You don't have to use a dependency injection framework. You can literally make it the last parameter and default to a concrete. And so the only arity requirement for Python is that if you have two arguments, you must pass two arguments. It's not like JavaScript where it's very flexible. Cool, it's gonna get two arguments. The third is optional, which means AWS is only gonna give you your event of who triggered your Lambda and the context of how your Lambda is being run. That's it. So now you can write it like this, but then you can write a unit test with a sub and your code is, as long as it has the basic request, you know, API, then your code is unit tested. That's amazing. But watch how quickly you can go to an integration test simply by del deleting the third parameter, suddenly it's an integration test. So you can do your unit test, make sure your code work, fail fast, right? No, you don't care if your wireless is up or anything else. But then you can do integration testing to make sure either locally or in some kind of pipeline that it works with real infrastructure. So when you deploy this Lambda with other things, you can see if they work. And they, they don't have to be real HTTP calls. It could be like real HTTP call to a stub or a mock or mount a bank or something like that, right? But the point is you got these layers and if they're test the, using this style of coding, it's a little easier to configure that, right? Let's code. So this philosophy around functions, input, outputs, purity, statelessness, it goes with your architecture too. It doesn't matter if you have an API gateway, like some kind of URL and your Lambda is invoked with a URL HTTP request. Normally things like Express handle that for you, but now it's on you and there's frameworks to handle that to help. But the point is you get a bunch of JSON, it's an HTTP request. You gotta see, is it a get or a post? What's the path? Does it have any query parameters? Are you gonna parse them, right? And then respond with something. It's that, that same philosophy is there. So it's no different locally and remotely, but that could be a bucket. You drop a file, you get JSON as a file, input, output. Uh, Amazon Event Bridge, it's a stateless event, but it invoked you. What are you gonna do with that event? You gotta tell somebody about it, right? And so that input, output, it either takes inputs, takes outputs. 
So these are a little different than like that empty dictionary, okay? <laughs> Some of these are really big, especially the API gateway ones. So if you use an AWS SAM or serverless application model, it's got a CLI that can help you generate some of these JSON events, it helps. Um, so a lot of these tests that you're gonna do, even unit tests have this really big JSON. SAM can generate them. So you just SAM local generate event and pick the service. So that leads me to a functional test. This is where the dream comes crashing down of stateless. At some point, somebody somewhere has to do the side effect to see it all work. And there's only, so much you can do to put state as somebody else's problem. And it depends on how much of this is mocked too. This might be a, a what we call a white box test where like we can kind of see inside it and see what's really going on as opposed to like an airplane black box where we don't know how it works, but it's we know something's in there and we can you know flight record data. The reason the white box is helpful is that you can tweak how real end to end it is, how many side effects are actually happening. But there's not a lot of tools yet, such as Elm, to make these things easier. So at some point, you're going to have to do the side effects yourself. A setup, right, or a teardown. You have to set up, put in the file in the bucket, see it trigger your Lambda, and go look for whatever your Lambda did as a side effect, right? Look in the logs, look in the Dynamo table that it wrote to, things like that. So that, that's still something you're going to have to deal with. It's not, you know, this wonderful, ideal situation still. But it's still input-output, right? And you can look from the side effects perspective. So this gets worse. What if you have a ton of lambdas, of step functions, of SNS creating a lot of state? H how do you test that? Do you go back to the drawing board with unit test? Do you tweak everything to take mocks? Like how does that work? Well, Amazon has a thing or a service called a step function that allows you, it was specifically built to test, to kind of bring together all these microservices in a single place to orchestrate. Normally we would create like, let's say a node API or a Django API that would call a bunch of mini downstream APIs, like a promise at all, or a bunch of promises, bring it together and then give you the JSON you want, or maybe different JSON for the front end or back. But you would call these downstream and upstream systems for your front end or back end. And those orchestrate would, you know, take all the data and the APIs and the authentication and kind of bring all mini APIs to one simple API that you need for yourself. Step functions are very similar to that and that they orchestrate all those downstream systems, but it's okay if they're idempotent. I mean, they do weird things, different things, that's okay. You can guarantee that you know exactly what state your step function can go into. Now, obviously as it gets bigger, it gets exponential, but ignore all that, ignore what the step function does, focus on the name. <laughs> so if you squint, it starts to look very familiar. It has the word function in it. And it starts to dawn on you that, like, wait a minute, like I could treat my idempotent infrastructure that's not totally stateless as like a stateless function, but it's like in the infrastructure, dude. Like that's super compelling. And so if you think like that, then suddenly your end-to-end -end tests become a little bit simpler to write because then you're saying, here's an input, I call a function, I take the output, and I assert that the output matches what I expect based on an input. And so it could be mocked too. You don't, this doesn't have to be a function test that actually has your lambdas doing real side effects, but it could. And this is, this is kind of, even with the statelessness, it can still help you with gallons of state. And that's a super, super awesome and, and really, really compelling way to develop code uh, from an attitude perspective, from a code perspective, from an, an infrastructure perspective. The learning path for stateless infrastructure is not as, in my opinion, hard considering the fact that I, hate ops. I don't like DevOps. I don't like operations. I hate infrastructure and servers. Um, but if you've never done this before, build a Lambda lift. Don't build microservices. Start with, you know, start with a monolith. Just put it in a Lambda. So take the same Node Express or the same Django, you know, API or Ruby API, whatever you build, Spring Boot, doesn't matter. Put it in a Lambda. Don't put it in EC2. Don't put it in Docker. Don't put it in EKS. Make sure you can do two things. You can run it locally. You can just go Maven run or whatever, but you have access to see it and then run it from Lambda. You put it in Lambda and run tests. You don't even have to use scripts. You could use the console in ABS and hit test. See that work, get a feel for it, get a feeling around the input output and really embrace that concept. You'll get really comfortable. After that, start looking at all your code and your tests and think about what requires mocks and try to use stubs. You don't have to do it for everything. Some of these things are impossible. They use class-based languages. It's almost impossible to make everything a stub. But think about that, practice that, really see how you can use stubs instead of mocks, how you can write really efficient stubs instead of having to make them just as big as your mocks, right? And then third, split things with side effects into microservices. Now there's a good article 
that I'll post in the comments. Uh, it's not at the end of the slide, but it's important because it talks about if you split too many microservices, you have all these cross-cutting concerns and suddenly this Lambda knows about everything else and causes latency because it was better just to co-locate the, the code. If you literally had four functions living next to you get each other, you wouldn't need to have four Lambdas calling each other, right? That's, that's, that's the nuance. I want you to focus on thinking about side effects in your code and how you can separate those side effects so things like stack functions and SQS and others can retry for you. You don't have to worry about the retry. You don't have to handle the, the failures for that. You let AWS do that. So think on kind of when you're orchestrating or writing a monolith of code, where you can take those side effects out. I'm making a database call. I'm going to put that in the microservice. I'm making an API call, that kind of stuff. And then finally, you can orchestrate a lot of that. Not all of it, but a lot of that with step functions. So if you have a lot of ETL jobs, like I, I, my coworker Andrew taught me this, extract, transform, load, that kind of stuff, batch, um, but also processes. It could be APIs. It could be human involved. Again, these step functions can run for up to a year. So think about those kind of things of how you can orchestrate your app just from a testing perspective. You don't even need to deploy the step function. It could just facilitate easier end-to-end -end testing, right, to guarantee that you have determinism in the infrastructure. And then lastly, when you have really, really high throughput systems, especially when you have a lot of pieces and reactive architectures where this event triggers this event, I would look into a lot of the reactive architecture out there. The, the, the stuff that's not from the reactive manifesto. It spoke, the stuff, that's not, that's not English. <laughs> it's a bunch of ivy tower stuff that doesn't make any sense. Wizards in the tower, right? What, what you need is read the Medium blog post to talk about like RxJS or RxJava. Things that they talk about how you react. Look at things like message, message queues or CQRS and read Martin Fowler's articles on those. Those will help you understand how to fan out and scale these stateless architectures with a lot of that state and, and try to make them as stateless as possible because distributed architectures are really hard, even with state. The whole point of stateless, right, is they, they can do the same thing at the same time because there's no state so they don't hurt each other. That, that doesn't always work out like that. So tr try and practice and think about that from a higher throughput system. But once you got one through four, you're more well-equipped for five. All right, so to summarize why we're doing this, the goal of stateless programming is to make state someone else's problem. That means from a code perspective, a future you or the language or the runtime or a library. And then from an infrastructure case, it means AWS, but it also from a code case too. There's a lot of things in code now. I mean, take concurrency. We don't have to do a lot of concurrency now in code. We don't have to do promise that all in JavaScript. We don't have to do in Elixir or Erlang a lot of the message box when you can do concurrency and fan out in AWS and you just pay for the concurrency and it's deterministic on there and you don't have to write code for that. So suddenly what's the point of using forever or PM2 and node when you can use ECS and they spawn Docker containers. So each node has a single process. Well, I'm not using the CPU, dude, it's node. Like, do we really, are we trying to compete with Java? No, we're just trying to be cheap, get it done, get it quick, get it easy to maintain, simple JavaScript, a lot of flexibility with the libraries and pop, pop it up there. Same with the serverless architectures. You can have concurrent lambdas. That's what it's built for, from a burst you know, perspective. So suddenly, do you really care that you only have one CPU core? Not really, because then you have 50 lambdas and it's really cheap to spawn those. It's really inexpensive. So this is what we mean by letting AWS manage those problems. If stateless code is easier to test and state is hard, then offloading that state to somebody else makes your code a lot more predictable to that work and you just deal with the state in either one place that's really dangerous and you whip out the big guns. You know, you have like five Red Bulls, like 20 hours of sleep. You're like, all right, today I'm gonna work on this hard problem. But also AWS can manage some of those problems. A lot of those things that you would normally use code for from a concurrency perspective, from a retry perspective, let AWS handle that. Uh, stateless infrastructure is easier to test in terms of you don't have to do, all right, does my process on uncaught exception and process dot on uncaught asynchronous exception stop the container, report an error, send the data, like all those, a lot of those little problems go away. The monitoring that you have to do from around that perspective on setting up pager duty to go, if your infrastructure goes down, that goes away, right? And so when you think about stateless infrastructure is easy to test, it's also easier to monitor. You, you still have to monitor it. There's a lot of things that can break serverless, especially in big companies. But my point is, those, there's just so many problems that just fade away. They're no longer a problem. It's not like they, they're kind of a problem. They're not. And then, so what that means is, is from an action perspective, you focus on writing stateless code and then in AWS manages the state and infrastructure. And again, to reiterate what is state and code, we're talking about variables, loops, classes, files and database, anything that wraps state, things that could change over time, infrastructure, 
Your server is either up or down. It's in a terminating state. You have four that are healthy, one that's unhealthy. Your AMIs, when you refresh all them, they could break your EC2s or your, your cluster. Uh, how's your Docker container doing? Is it okay? Is it your code that's causing a problem or some of the libraries within it? The running code health. Is your code that's running for a long time, is your server up? Is it using too much memory? What if those problems could go away? Files, is the files that you expect to be there like ready or is it a config file? In the reverse, are you logging to a file and you accidentally didn't do Unix standard out so now it's on your box, you ran out of room because you've been logging for the past week and then your EC2 goes down because it added no more, more room. Uh, database data, is it there or not? Is it a QA or not? Did you back it up or not? Are you running unit test against a QA that never goes down? That kind of stuff. And downstream services, man. You're legit, but are other people? <laughs> like, who knows? Let's hope you're awesome. You're definitely awesome. All right, so how do we do this? From offloading state to AWS, you, you want to write, in a code perspective, pure functions, right? Make sure that your code is stateless. Dependency injection and the effect pattern will help you make it more testable, defer the side effects, make it somebody else's problem. So anytime you see a variable or a loop or a file or a database of concurrency, think about what's the corresponding AWS service you could possibly use or one that's almost helpful because sometimes there's regulation reasons why you can't use all of them, for example. Like I can't use API Gateway, right? Uh, EC2 to Lambda would be an example. Take your server, put on Lambda. Uh, if you don't need that much power, you know, spawn more Lambdas. Uh, ECS to batch. It, ECS, if you want a server that has a bunch of different pro programs that all run at the same time, you want to have three node servers in case one goes down. Cool. If you're, if you're not doing real time stuff, you can move to batch. Um, orchestration API to step function. So a, a lot of the early node APIs I would write would be orchestrator functions. You'd have a simple API that would talk to a bunch of downstream systems to show data for a user signing up for a service on a website. You know, the marketing, the analytics, the login, the profiles, all that stuff. Um, so if you move that to a step function, it helps orchestrate some of that stuff and helps facilitate easier health check and testing in some cases, not all cases. Concurrency to SQS. Kinesis, those things are built for concurrency and fanning out. They're not, uh, Kinesis is a big, big jump <laughs> from SQS. So just start with SQS. If you've never done message queues, it's, those are really fun to play with. And then performance tests. The, a lot of times these serverless things are actually smaller and less power on purpose because you often don't need it, but sometimes you do. And so it's important to performance test and see what the throughput really is to know how you should horizontally scale. Because again, that's what AWS is built for, throwing more money so they give you more stuff because the stuff generally is cheap. So getting more horizontal lambdas or an extra EC2, it's not, it's not expensive anymore. And how to test. We write functions that take inputs. You have them return outputs. You then assert that those outputs are expected from those particular inputs. That's the secret. You do that, then everything else down after this gets a little a little more, okay, I got it. So AWS SAM, it's a serverless application model. It allows you to do mono repos instead of minim, minim, many, many different GitHub repos with configurations deploy independently. So you can still deploy independently. You can still use native cloud formation. They just have a little few enhancements on top of it. It makes it easy, but it's in a single repo, which can help if you're dealing with a lot of stuff. Um, and so it generates a lot of the JSON inputs so you can help when you're doing those testing for those AWS services. Now, EventBridge has a schema that actually will look at your events and start giving you strong typing. That's cool, but I still recommend you do contract tests, even if it's yourself, not just a downstream system, mainly because you can never guarantee, because you, you, you reserve the right to change your mind, whether in programming or in life or in politics or in spirituality, you reserve the right to change your mind. And that's very, very important programming. So contract tests should help, help that, not hinder that, okay? Uh, you still should use property tests. So, just because you have types and you're amazing, you can have an add function that minuses. You can have a regex that missed that one, you know, weird character emoji, right? So you still should have property tests that test the same function with a hundred different inputs. So you only write one unit test instead of a hundred. And then and in the functional test, your microservices, step functions can really help from a testing perspective. So you don't have to use them for app deployments. You can just use them for health and, and concurrent, dealing with a lot of concurrency problems the error handling problems. Very similar to like promise that all with like a try catch and like a finally, right? You don't have to worry about the catch, you know, firing for every little thing. The IAM roles and security groups are still state all throughout AWS and they can still cause problems even if your serverless hasn't been touched in years. All somebody has to do is change one role or less 
modify one policy or even adjust a security group and then suddenly nothing works. So it's still important to have monitoring. It's still important to test. That's not, that's just a fact. We're not going to get away from that. So it's, I have this ideal, this ivory tower love of stateless, but those problems, it's just the way it is. So if you got any more questions, I'm on Twitter, Jester Excel. You can email me at Jesse Warren. I want to cover some of these things first. The top here in the test nomenclature, hello Wayne talks about the different types of tests, what they mean, their names. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Brian Lornsdorf. He, he's got a really good functional programming JavaScript book. It talks about functional programming. So ignore the JavaScript part. It just focuses on a lot of the reasons why we do functional programming. And he has a very category theory style approach to it. He's got a lot of the good, you know, basics around it, why we do it, but also covers the real use of terms. I'm a lot more slack. I don't think types matter, category theory matters, with the exclusion of some minor lens things. So I have a different take. My book's still in progress, but hopefully some of the earlier chapters should help out a lot if you've never seen it before. And if you look at this dependency injection side effects, if you're wondering what's the difference from DI and FI, if you're in Python, Lua, JavaScript, Ruby, um, not so much Go, a little bit, you probably could, um, but it'd be, uh, even some of the Java 11 stuff could probably allow you to do this too. It basically explains the difference between doing DI and effects and how you architect those. And it's really long, really, really in depth. It's a great, great article that you give you if you've never seen that effects before or the DI before. Uh, functional Tump Save Python, we do it a lot of Python at work. I, I bring this up because the documentation for that library really hits home a lot of the algebraic data types that aren't brought up a lot. So if you're trying to build stateless architectures, you can't have exceptions, you can't have errors, and you really need to clearly demarcate where your IO is, where your side effects are. And so his documentation really, I think, explains those things, not just as well as like, here's how you use this library in Python, but like what they are and why you use them. I think it's a, a really great, great way to do it. Um, if, you, if you're in JavaScript, go look at uh, Folktale version two. That's, that would kind of kind of be the equivalent. Um, this guy's got a lot more types from a PM2 perspective. In Python lenses, uh, he's got all of them, man. Like there's some good libraries in lenses for JavaScript, but this Python lens library, it's, it's really good. He's got all the isomorphisms, prisms. It's a, it, it allows you to safely access data with a really terse syntax and you can optionally do it in a safe way. So I've just been very, very impressed with the docs for that as well. They kind of assume you've never used lenses before and that's kind of neat. If you've never used AWS SAM, there's tons of ways. A lot of people, I know my friends are using AWS SD, uh, CDK, but I like SAM because I, I, I focus on serverless and I focus on monorepos deploying my app, right? It might be a bunch of microservices, but it's my app and I test my app that integrates with downstream systems. So SAM really helps that from even if you have multiple people on the same team, you want to deploy that same thing, or you want to deploy just little bits, you retain the right to deploy your app or independently deploy services with the same repo, with the same template, single source of truth for your infrastructure. Really, really cool. Um, so I like Sam a lot. I hate the source code. <laughs> I, it's, I just, I can't, can't do it. There's a, a wonderful set of wonderful articles by the Bernie Monk. He's got so many great articles on the design patterns. Like what does fan out mean? And you know, how, why should you use many lambdas instead of one lambda lift? Like, is it all for nothing? Is it always the rule? He explains all the nuances of that. A lot of great articles. Guy's got a lot of experience and you should definitely check him out. Um, and then lastly, serverless to Elixir. This article is so neat because it talks about how the existing Lambda log parsing infrastructure just didn't scale to the volume they were looking at from a cost perspective. They were spending like, I don't know, 30K or something a month. And they rewrote it all in a variety of languages and eventually set it on Elixir because of concurrency of like, you know, horizontally scaling very well on cheap hardware to use the most of it to be able to parse a bunch of logs at the same time in a very efficient way using servers. And so they actually moved away from serverless to a more server-based architecture. I mean, they probably are using Kubernetes at this point, but what I liked about it was if you look at the bottom of the article, they talk about how dependable that was for years. All they did was throw money at it and it worked. I have never in my career thrown money at programmers and things work, <laughs> myself included. So I just, I found that article super compelling about how somebody was moving around serverless they had enough runway where that thing was working, like chugging along, where they could confidently spend time and not context switch to manage it, right? Which is, as you know, from a programming perspective, context switching is death. 
So being able to do that, I, just, I thought that was super, super compelling. So definitely a cool article if you're curious about that. So again, I'm Jesse Warden. You got other questions about this, how to do stateless testing, stateless architecture. Hope it helps get you excited about using some of the serverless things with the functional programming style. Makes your testing life easier. And if you got any other questions, let me know in the comments on Twitter, email me. It's all good. Thanks for your time. Hope it was helpful.